too, Paul. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, I just watched the film again, and it was um, just really such a fascinating film, and so so awesome to see um, a film about a community that's made from someone from within the community, where you, you just sense that it's not, you know, like the, the kind of outside gaze. It's really kind of like bringing bringing the characters to life. Um, I guess. Um, uh, Tell me how you, how you got started with this project. Sure, uh, I was in the senior year. Well, first of all, thank you, Man Flakes, for having us. Uh, and thank you for watching the film for those who are at home watching. Uh, I started this film in the summer of my first year at Columbia University. Um, and it was a really pivotal moment in my life because my classmates were all going home for, at, for the summer. And they had, you know, their parents and their siblings and all of this kind of fanfare about going back home. And I kind of asked myself what home was for me. And I found myself asking that question. And one day I looked up and I was on Christopher Street. I was on the pier. And I looked around and I saw all of these people who look like me on this pier. And I realized that home is a place where one is most deeply understood. And Christopher Street is that place for me because when I was 16, I was kicked out of my home for being gay. And I'm from New Jersey and right across the bridge from New York. So I grew up kind of going to New York City when I was, but I didn't have any money. So you could just go look at buildings because it was free. And um, I ended up following some people who led me to Christopher Street for the first time. And when I was 16 and then, you know, about, you know, 15 years later, when I was in my early 30s, beginning my college career, I had this realization that this is the one place in the world where everyone kind of understands me without saying a word, because we all kind of have this history uh, in common. Yeah, yeah. So um, I guess in the, so in the course of making this film, um, you, the, it, it has a really interesting structure where the beginning is kind of like a carousel of these different characters and then it, it gradually kind of um, hones in on, on specific characters. Um, how, how did that um, structure evolve? Uh, that structure evolved, I mean, one, it evolved organically in that when I began the project, I began talking to anybody who would talk to me who looked like they might understand this strange idea of being at home outside. And over time, Crystal kind of came to me and said, gave me a kind of ultimatum. And she said, if you want to tell my story, then you have to be my friend. You have to be on my side when things go bad. You have to care that I, you know, that I'm taken care of, that I, I'm fed when I'm hungry. I'm safe when I feel um, threatened. And that type of relationship really revealed to me so much more about the the nature of being homeless or being queer. So I kind of took that as a model, I took that as a stylistic cue to change my relationship to how I was telling the story to say that, you know, in the beginning, it was important for me to kind of identify what a peer kid is. I came up with the term. Uh, uh, it's not just the name of my film, but it's a, a term that I, I kind of coined when I was an undergrad. So I wanted to show like the tapestry of where all of these different types of people are indeed peer kids. But then once that was established, I wanted to talk about the thing that makes us peer kids, this kind of challenge we have with our, with our biological families for acceptance. And the only way to tell that story is to really be friends with people, have that one-on-one -on -one relationship. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess it, it's also, it's just such an interesting look at, um, sex workers generally, and I guess sex, sex workers of color. Um, I, 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 what really struck me this time was, was the, the comment by the one, the one character who said that um, he would rather, rather than making a low wage working for the white men, he'd, he'd rather be out there ju juicing one. And I thought, wow, that's a really interesting political uh, point of view. And what, what, what did you, what's your reaction to that? Well, just to be clear, that's my good girlfriend, Lexi. And she's a real uh, inspiration to me, especially at this time. Um, what do I make of that? I think that we are in a moment in our political history where 
it feels as though, I mean, the earth is telling us, right, all these wildfires that are burning your way, all the smog that's out my way, and I've hopefully will not turn into wildfires on this side anytime soon. But nature is telling us that we've kind of reached the end of this type of uh, exploitation, that the notion that people can, you know, work 40 hours a week and be able to sustain themselves in America's cities is over and we need to find something new. So when Lexi says, I'd rather juice these white men for their money than work a job, get, get out of them in one night, but I can get out of them in one week working a real job. I think that's, you know, that's a condemnation. That's a challenge to the system that we're in right now to say that we need new ideas. We need new ways to make people useful to this economy, which means we need new economies. So uh, yeah, I, I take it. There's a lot of moments in this film where my voice comes through. I'm a very skeptical person and I really do get this particular kind of thrill out of speaking truth to power because I do believe that every person has power. All of us have power and we need to use that power to imagine a new world that can accommodate people like Lexi, but can also accommodate us. We, we can't expect 6 billion people to work 40 hours a week in order to sustain themselves and not expect our planet to be on fire. Yeah, yeah. Um, cool, so, and, and also I apologize if I, I think I got my pronouns wrong in the wrong, that last question. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, I, I wanted to ask you also about um, just your experience so um, fo following uh, um, Crystal's story and meeting her family, um, it, I was really, um, you know, pleasantly surprised at how, how open his, her family was able to be considering what a difficult kind of transition they were going through. And what, how did that feel to you? Well, I mean, I love that you acknowledge that everyone is transitioning. I think very often when you see stories of trans people, it's always put on the person who's transitioning and it's not acknowledged that the whole family has to transition, the whole family has to change how it sees that person. So thank you for saying that. And for me, it was extremely like triggering because for me, like when I got kicked out of my house, I didn't necessarily really come out. I didn't get an opportunity to come out. It was more like I got an ultimatum to get a girlfriend, something I knew I would not be able to do. So I left. Some people would say I chose to leave. Some people would say I was pushed to leave. I kind of feel like I land somewhere in the middle. And peer kids, and, and I feel like the reason that happened is that you know the contemporary gay rights movement, it just didn't reach my poor black working class family. It just, it, those, the terms that we use to make queer people more tolerated hopefully accepted, but definitely more tolerated, that type of language was not in my community. So it was left to me as a child to try to explain myself and find, develop empathy with a parent who was, because of religion and because of kind of social economic pressure, just was homophobic. So when I was with Crystal and her family, to a certain extent, these are conversations I wish I'd had a chance to have with my family. And um, it just, it was really, it was really triggering. But then at the same time, it was really beautiful because I got to be a part of an awkward and problematic healing process. I felt that in that moment, I was able to use the trauma that I'd been through to plug in to the immediate trauma that Crystal was having to navigate. And the fact that she did that act of love, that she made herself available to her family in at times in ways that were, I don't know if their family meant to humiliate her, but I do think that there was a lot of shaming going on. And for Crystal to be so gracious to offer that opportunity to myself and, and really to all of us who watch the film, you know, I feel lucky to have been present for that and to, and in general in my life, to kind of take the things that I've been through that are painful for me and to try to make them into something that is educational for someone else. So it was complicated, but I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that I had the chance to be there. 
that's my yeah. friend. That's my that's my friend. You know what I mean? So I got to be there to look out for my friend too. So that that was also quite quite amazing. I mean, um, I, I, I I kind of wonder if having the camera there was almost the way. Like, did that help the process or or hinder it or or what? What do you think it was like for for the family members? I think ultimately it was helpful because I mean one. You know, you never know how this goes because we live in a reality. We have a reality TV president, and he he acts a monkey fool all the time. So, but um, you know, I think in this instance, having the camera there, they wanted to present themselves as best as they could, and the only thing you can do in that situation is to speak your piece and then to listen to what's said after. And I think that that type of community, like that right there, let someone speak listen to what they have to say and then when you're done speaking listen to what the other person has to say and then everybody just sits there and thinks about it for a second and they find the song that they have in common and i kind of think that's a lesson for life as a lesson for conflict you know we live in a society that is so polarized right now and sometimes all you have to do is just like listen to someone you disagree with and hear them out and you might find something in the middle that you can agree on. And then once you agree on one thing, it makes the thing you disagree on a little less potent. Like today, Crystal and her family, I'm not gonna say they have a perfect relationship, but they have a relationship where she's able to be her true self at home. Nice. And what would have happened if she didn't go through that awkward and painful experience that happened on screen? At least that's what she tells me. Yeah, yeah. Um... I'm I'm curious. Um, I mean, I, I I did a little research on you, and I, I know that you went from from being homeless to going to some really prestigious um, uh, schools, and and uh, you know you you're here with us today. Obviously, you know, doing really well. Um, I guess I'm you know on the one hand, I'm like you know some people would say, well, you see, you know, anyone can do it. But, um, but I guess what would be, what, what's your experience? I guess what, how were you able to, to pull yourself out of that? And, and also what, what do you think your, your personal experience means in a, in a broader context? Um, well, for me, I thank you for that. It's very kind of you. Um, I pulled myself out. Ultimately, I understood that I was supposed to do more than what I was doing at that time in my life. I believe that I still believe that even though things are much different than when I was homeless, I think there's much more that I have to do and be even more um, successful than where I'm at right now. You know, um, the short story, I called my mother up when I was 25. I was at a shelter, kind of reached the end of my, my rope in terms of like, you know, you're not as young as you were and you're, I mean, 25 is still young, but I felt very old, five years to 30. Now I'm many a couple of years past my 30s, so it's not. It, I, was, I was young then. I was still young, but uh, go figure. But um, you know, at that time I'd kind of run out of options. So I called my mother up and I asked if I can come home, and she asked me if I was still gay. Of course, the answer was yes, and she suggested that I join the military. So at, when she said it, I was really offended by that. I was like, "Wow, you'd rather me be." This is Iraq war time, though, so you'd rather me be blown up on the side of the road than be gay in your household. That's like really a painful thing. And then I went back to the shelter and everybody, it was time to go to bed and you look around and there was, the room was filled with maybe like a hundred men, most of whom were black, most of whom had been living this type of lifestyle for many decades, many more decades than I had been living it. And I kind of looked around and I'm like, is this me? And the answer was no. And then the next morning, a recruiter showed up and kind of picked me out of the lineup to talk to about joining the Marine Corps. And I was just like, man, if I could look as good in that uniform as you do, then <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm going to give it a try. So I signed up. I took a test. And I scored really high on that test. And my recruiter is the one who suggested I be a filmmaker for the Marines. And I didn't even know they had that in the Marine Corps. And I, and I didn't even know that I could do something like that. But, you know, I, I scored high enough to where I wanted a job in the Corps. But I, um, I didn't want to do intelligence. 
because I'm not a snitch. I'm not going to tell other people's business, you know. I'm, I'm kind of a snitch, I guess, if you look at pure kids, but not in that way. It's a different kind of way. And then um, the other thing was to be a, a, a journalist, and I read the news voraciously. I'm very uh, up to date on current events, but I'm not quite interested. I, I'm too, I have too much of an opinion to really be a good journalist. I'm not, I'm not good at being unbiased. And then he showed me a picture of a Marine hanging outside of a helicopter with like this huge lens and over a jungle. And I was like, wow, that looks cool. I'd love to do that. That's what they do. Sign me up. And, uh, you know, a few years later, this is where I'm at. You know, I, I stuck to it. I, I, I never stopped. And I could tell you this much when I was a filmmaker, you know, I don't forget I was on base and uh, even my first six months on base and his general calls me to his office and I was very lowly ranked. So when a general calls you to his office, you're like, oh no, what have I done? Is this, is this the jig up? I'm gonna be kicked out, you know? And he calls me and he's written a script for his retirement. Cause that was mostly what I shot was like retirement ceremonies and the occasional actuality film where you show how weapons work or whatever. And uh, a, few, a few other more creative projects, but mostly those two things. So he shows me his script and he's like, hey, Bratton, what do you think of this? And I'm like, it took me a minute to really hear him because that, I remember it like yesterday because it was the first time a straight white man had ever asked me what I thought about anything. And I was like, wow. And, and I'm like, why is he asking me my opinion? This man, and his office was crazy too because he had, um, it was like Dr. Strangelove because the base I was at is Marine Corps, Forces Pacific, uh, Mar 4 Pack, for those who know. And his office had a map of the world in it. And he prided himself on the fact that he controlled two thirds of the Earth's surface. So he had his little insignia all over the Earth. So this white man who owns the world asked me <laughs> what I think, you know, it was, and I'm like, well, he thinks I'm a film director. So that's why he thinks I'm supposed to know what I'm talking about. And I was like, okay, well, if this gets people to listen to you, then I'm gonna keep figuring this out, how to do this. And I went to Columbia after that and I, I, I got to know myself. I studied African-American studies, uh, anthropology, and French. I did my first photo book at Columbia called Bound by Night. It won a really prestigious art book award in Western Europe, the Castle Art Book Award. I did, um, I started shooting peer kids while I was at school. Shot 400 hours of footage, realized I didn't know how to edit a movie, applied to, Col and applied to NYU Tisch so I could learn how to edit my 400 hours of footage. I made my first narrative short, Walk For Me. Walk For Me led to my first TV show, My House. I forgot that I met my husband and creative partner, Chester Algerno Gordon, who produced this film and produces all my work. So, you know, bit by bit, it all started to kind of take shape that this is what I was gonna do with my life. But um, yeah, that's how I got out of it. And the other side of your question was, what did I have to, what did you say, what was the second part of that question? Sorry. I guess, um... What, what kind of um, strength or support did you have to be able oh, to, like, okay. unlike a lot of other people, what is um, be able to? Right, what does this say for others? What I can say is this, you hear my story is literally one in a million, right? Like, and if you knew the background I came from before all this started, it's like one in 10 million. You know, I had a very difficult, rocky childhood, to say the least. And um, so what I'm saying is, is that, there's some people in our country who believe that the poor just need to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and make it happen like I did. And the opportunities that I've made happen, the fact that I get to make movies for a living, literally one in a million people get to make movies. One in a million people get to go to Ivy League schools. I'm not trying to say that to big myself up. I'm saying that because I think that part of our country that believes in this bootstrapping mentality needs to really check themselves and understand that the current economic political climate means that if you are a black male and you were born poor in this country, you're more likely to be in jail than you are to be in school, not necessarily through any fault of your own, but because of systemic barriers that have been, that have been instituted before you were even an idea. This thing has been set up to corral you into a certain direction. So to put this pressure on people to, to be the one in a million is just immoral and unethical, you know? So I, I feel obligated because I kind of occupy some space of privilege, right? That 
when I when I'm asked questions like this to remind people that you know I signed up with the potential of being blown up on the side of the road someday. Yeah. On the hope that I wouldn't end up in a homeless shelter again. Right. Yeah. So what I what I want to tell people who are in that situation is you have the power within you. Any difficulty you face, whether that's homelessness or divorce or drug addiction or whatever, whatever it is that you feel like is holding you back, you have the power within you to change that all that. But what you must do is listen. You must listen to the voice inside of you, the light inside of you, and follow it and trust that and believe in yourself no matter where you are, you know? And on the other side of that, for those of us who are, have the power to make it better for people, make it better for people, make governments that make it possible for people not to have to be one in a million in order to survive and thrive in this country. Yeah, yeah, thank you, that's so beautifully stated. Um, we have a couple, few quick, I think you've, maybe you've answered some of these audience questions already. Um, over what period of time did you shoot, shoot and how much footage did you shoot and how did you coalesce it into a film? Um, we kind of covered it. We did a little bit, 2011, but they asked, they showed up to watch, so I answered again. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. 2011, we shot the movie 2011 to 2016. We amassed about 400 hours of footage to decide what the movie would be, the 84 minutes that y'all that y'all got the chance to enjoy. I we basically, my, my partner got tired of me taking forever, like everyone else did to finish it, maybe right on an outline. And I realized that this movie is all about the power of family for revolutionary change. So with that kind of guiding principle and some time at NYU Tisch cutting my own other films, cutting narrative films and learning that part of the art of cinema, I was able to kind of prioritize the footage in such a way to where, you know, essentially you're out for one night in the summer. You meet three people, three paths to follow. And, you know, you saw the rest. So that's how. Um, Thank okay, you. Another audience question: Did your time in the military inform the way you approached your filmmaking? It did at first. It still does. I mean, you know, I think like the thing I get from the Marines that is completely brainwashed into my cells is this idea of meeting the mission, the goal. I think directors have it in. It's just a, a part of their DNA to be obsessive about goals and timelines and objectives and the military has given me this just rapacious hunger to finish what i start so um on that regard that's what i still keep is that spirit um and i still write about i have my i'm making my first fiction feature very soon um with my partner uh, chester and also with effie brown and another really great producer I can't announce just yet, a financier. But um, yeah, like, so in that movie is about, it's called The Inspection. It's about a homeless kid who joins the Marine Corps to change his life, but then has to conceal his attraction to his drill instructor to survive boot camp. So I'm still using the military as, you know, material, but the military style of filmmaking is just very didactic. You know, it's very much like, you sit down and you ask these questions and you look at the camera this way and you light it that way and that's it, you get people. So I think I've, I've added a much, a lot more nuance and craft to what I do after the Marines. But, you know, I, I loved my time in the Marines. I loved making those something. But I'm still myself. I remember like, you know, it was Don't Ask, Don't Tell. So one of my first assignments with the camera was to film like men working out. And he's like, you know, Marines working out. So he's like the most beautiful, just, Grecian bodies you've ever imagined and my footage definitely appreciates the male form like you it was different from everybody else's footage you know so I think I think a lot of who I am was has always been present in my filmmaking but I, I've tried to add a bit more uh sophistication to it as, as I've gone forward Cool. So, um, so we saw we saw Buck, and now your uh, your next project sounds like it's a, a fiction film. Is that is that are you going into more of a fiction direction, or, or how do you see your your career evolving as a filmmaker going forward? I want to be like 
you know, my favorite filmmakers. I really, really look up to Spike Lee. I look up to Casey Lemons. You know, I, I admire uh, the acumen of Tyler Perry. I admire every one of my, and those are just the black ones, right? Then you've got people like Gio Pantacorvo, who I absolutely adore, uh, Mike Lee, who I absolutely adore, um, JJ Abrams, who I'm a big fan of as well. So they all do everything. You know, they all do documentaries, they do fiction, they do commercials, they do comedies, they do dramas, they do television. Uh, I had a TV show in Viceland called My House that aired in 2018. We got nominated for a uh, GLAAD award and got, and got one award at Cannes for diversity. Uh, that's a documentary follow series. I have another TV show based off of Buck and Development with a really big company I can't announce just yet. So, um, you know, I want to do all of these things. I think more than anything, what I want, one day I want to have an overall deal with a major platform where I can make all of the different types of content I enjoy. And I want that deal to run through my own production camp company so I can continue to develop, you know, original content. So yeah, I, I kind of don't see a difference. I have like cinematic dyslexia. I don't really see a difference between documentary in fiction, I kind of think everything is edited at the end of the day and becomes somewhat fictionalized. So I just want to have an opportunity to be able to, to do what I love to do in as many forms as I, I can possibly do. Virtual reality, the whole thing, I want to do them all. Nice, nice. Well, well, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your film with us. It's been a, such a pleasure to, to, to have you here. And we were hoping to have you, obviously, in the flesh in Mammoth, but uh, that didn't happen. But 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 you'll be you'll be coming to the next festival. Uh, I know. <laughs> Is it really a spa? Y'all, it's a spa up there. That's what I hear. There's um there's hot springs. Yes. I love hot springs. The last time I was in a hot spring was in Iceland, like three years ago. They 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 revitalize you. I need to come up that way. Yes, for yeah. sure, for sure. Thank you. Uh, so, so yeah, so, so that's our Q&A. Don't, don't go away just yet. We're going we're gonna to cut off the feed, but I, I want to just chat with you just a moment, if you don't mind. And, uh, and thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. Thanks for watching the film, y'all. And support Mammoth Lakes. Donate to your local film festivals. They need all the support they can get so you can watch movies like this.